Heavenly Father, this evening as we reflect upon the cross of Christ, remind us, as one writer put it, it is not as if we start with the cross and move on, but rather that we start at the cross and move deeper. So help us this evening to deepen our understanding and appreciation of all that took place on that cross. May we understand it more profoundly and experience your life within us more intimately. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good evening and welcome to this very special Easter week communion service. The tone of our service tonight is much more subdued than usual because our purpose is to remember the solemn events of Good Friday, the death and crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to reflect upon their meaning. Every Easter season, we try and remind you to think of uh, not just Easter Sunday in isolation, but to think of Easter week. Think of it as a connected series of events that makes more sense when you understand the full, the full scope of what's happening during this week. You can't really appreciate Easter Sunday without understanding Good Friday. You can't really experience the joy of the resurrection without knowing something of the why of the crucifixion. Whereas the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is the central message of the Bible. Hear God's words that comes to us from 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, I delivered to you as of first importance. And what was it, Paul, that was of first importance? What, what was the central message? What was at the heart of the gospel? He said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose the third day. You see this emphasis on the centrality of the death of Christ in a number of different ways in scripture. You see it uh, first in dis the disproportionate amount of space that the New Testament writers give to that last week of Jesus' life. If you were to count up all the chapters in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 89 total chapters, and a full 30 of those chapters deal with the last week of Jesus' life. It's as if the New Testament writers wanted us to focus on that last week because they said this is what's of greatest importance. You see it also in the, the language that Jesus used. He talked about his hour. In the uh, first half of John's gospel, you'll see that phrase again and again as, as, as Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. At one point, they wanted to make him king, and he said, no, no, my hour has not yet come. Then all of a sudden, when you come to chapter 12, from 12 through chapters 21, almost half the book, uh, the narrative focuses on that last week of Jesus' life, and all of a sudden, you hear the language change. Jesus says, my hour has come. In other words, the, the hour for which I came into this world, the hour of my death is now at hand. You see it in the cross as the central symbol of the Christian church. In the early catacombs, the most dominant image was that of Jesus, the good shepherd. Pictures of Jesus with a lamb slung over his shoulders. Uh, for a time, it was the anchor reference in Hebrews to Jesus being an anchor for our soul in times of tribulation. For a while it was the ichthus sign, the, the sign of the fish, in which uh, basically functioned as a code for Christians to identify each other. One would write the upper arc and the other would finish it off. But the symbol that stuck, the symbol that you see on every church in America and across the world, is the cross. It's the enduring symbol because it's the central symbol. You see, it even in the rituals that uh, Jesus wanted to be remembered by, you remember we'll be celebrating communion here and a little later in our service, but Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, what is it that he wanted us to remember again and again and again? The heart of the gospel. He said, my body was broken for you. My blood has been poured out for you. 
It was the death and crucifixion of Jesus that was the centerpiece of the gospel message. And then the resurrection, which we'll celebrate on Sunday. Now, one of the best ways to understand the meaning of the cross is to unpack the so-called seven words from the cross. They're not literally single words as much as they are short sayings, utterances that Jesus made from the cross. And dying words are revealing words. They, they give you a little insight into the mind and heart of a person who's dying. Karl Marx, for instance, uh, who died in 1883, his housekeeper said to him, tell me your last words and I'll write them down. Marx replied, go on, get out of here. Last words are for fools. P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus fame said as he was dying, what were today's receipts? As if it mattered? John Wesley, what a contrast, the founder of Methodism, said, best of all, God is with us. Now let's look at the dying words of Jesus. I want to give you a, an overview first on a little time chart. You can put it up. Hebrew time started at sunrise there at the bottom, and then they identified the hours as the third hour, the sixth hour, the twelfth hour. Um, there are three designations of time uh, in the Passion narrative. Uh, first, we're told that at the third hour, Jesus was crucified. So it was about 9 o'clock that they put him on that cross. And from 9 to noon or 9 to the sixth hour, you'll see those first three um, sayings from the cross. Uh, Jesus' words to his executioners, uh, his words to the thief on the cross, and his words to his mother. And then it, and then it gives a second indication. It says, and at the sixth hour, darkness came over the face of the earth. Notice that period from the sixth to the ninth hour is shaded. Because it was during those hours that you see the, the greatest sense of abandonment and pain and agony in Jesus. It wasn't the physical pain of torture that was the greatest problem, it was the God-forsakenness, because it was during that period that God turned his back on his own son. He was excluded during those three hours. And then it says, just before the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., after he'd been hanging on that cross for six hours, there is a kind of a rapid succession of those four final sayings. Why have you forsaken me? I am thirsty. It is finished, and Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. This is something of a synopsis of Jesus' life. The first three statements give us an insight into his character, his, his example. The fourth and fifth move to his work of atonement, his mission in this world, why he came, and the sixth and the seventh point to his final victory. Now let's look at these sayings one by one. His first saying is really a prayer for his executioners. Jesus dies forgiving. Think about that. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Jesus had just gone through the mockery of a trial. He had suffered one of the most cruel forms of capital punishment ever invented. There were several ways you could kill people in, in those days, stoning, decapitation, burning people alive, hanging but in each of those situations, you basically go unconscious within seconds and then die within a minute. Not so with crucifixion. It was designed to be a cruel, horrendous way to die. People would hang up there for hours and hours, even days. One might reasonably expect Jesus to cry out in vengeance or to wallow in self-pity. or And yet doesn't even think of himself. His thoughts are for others. The cross is the epitome of his self-giving as he shows his concern first for the men who crucified him and second for the penitent thief who was dying beside him and thirdly for his mother. Let the force of that just settle into your soul for a second because it would have been perfectly understandable to cry out in pain for his physical and emotional sufferings would have been almost intolerable. But no, 
his first thoughts are of others. His first words are a prayer of forgiveness. He is literally practicing what he preached. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That is exactly what Jesus did. Now, for whom was he praying? Not only his Roman executioners and the Jewish leaders who had rejected their Messiah, but I would suggest to you that he's pointing beyond them to something even bigger. Do you remember that old hymn, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Were You There When They Nailed Him to a Tree? It was my sin. It was your sin that put him on that cross. Here's a second saying. You see, his passion for the lost. All four evangelists tell us that there were three crosses that day. Jesus was on the middle cross, and on each side were two robbers, two thieves, according to to Luke. Both thieves initially joined in hurling insults, but only one continued. Something happened to that so-called penitent thief probably as he watched the dignity with which Jesus was dying or heard his words of forgiveness to his executioners. He said, we are justly punished, but this man did nothing wrong. And turning to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' response to his request is remarkable. He didn't cynically criticize the thief for repenting at the 11th hour. He didn't cast doubt on the genuineness of his repentance. He simply gave him the assurance that he hoped for. He said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. And again, you're struck by the radical other-centeredness of Jesus. Rather than being preoccupied with his own justifiable suffering, He focused on the needs of others. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And even in the midst of his own suffering, he never loses sight of his mission. In the third saying, we see something of his concern and care for his mother. As Jesus would have looked down from the cross, he would have seen a little band of women. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Salome, his aunt, John, the beloved disciple, and his mother. John writes, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. And I want every mother to let that sink in for just a second. Can you imagine watching your own son go through the torture of crucifixion? Mary had conceived him in her womb by the Holy Spirit. She had given birth to him, cared for him during his childhood. It would have been Mary who had taught him all the Bible stories, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the kings, the prophets. She had modeled a godly life. It's hard to imagine the depth of grief as she watched him suffer. But once again, you see Jesus thinks not of his pain, but of hers. He's determined to spare her the anguish of seeing him die. And so he avails himself of a right that scholars tell us even a crucified man had. It was... uh, a provision in Jewish law called testamentary disposition. Using the language of family law, he said, Dear woman, his mother, this is your son, meaning John. And to John, John, this is your mother. And it says, immediately, John took her to Jerusalem. Looking back over these first three sayings from the cross, you're amazed at the unselfishness of Jesus, that he had no thought for himself. He prays for the forgiveness of his enemies. He promises paradise to a repentant thief. He makes provision for his bereaved mother. There's a tremendous lesson in this for all of us. Because when, we, when, we're, when we're suffering, when we're in pain, we naturally withdraw. We naturally tend to become self-absorbed with our own thoughts. Peter wrote, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. But I would suggest to you he gives us even more than an example. He gives us the the promise of new life because of the resurrection that he can actually come to live within us and allow us to live like that.
in the fourth, fourth and fifth sayings, Jesus moves from his character into his mission as a sin bearer. And there are no words, you remember, that are spoken from noon until just about 3 o'clock. In fulfillment of prophecy, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And then suddenly at just about, it says, at, at about nine, ninth hour, Jesus breaks the silence. And he speaks the remaining four sayings from the cross in probably fairly rapid succession. Beginning with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it was during that three-hour period, you see, that, that Jesus was absorbing your sin in mine. You heard that verse a little earlier from Natalie, 2 Corinthians 5. He who knew no sin became sin. You see, the only person who can take your sin and my sin is someone who doesn't have his own sin to die for. And that narrows it down uniquely to one person. And so as Jesus hung on that cross during those three hours, a holy God takes out his wrath against his own son. I like to ask people this question, who is the most sinful person in the world? And they give all the usual suspects, Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Osama bin Laden. And I, I love to surprise them by saying, no, it was Jesus. You see, he who knew no sin during that period became sin. The greatest thief, the greatest liar, the greatest adulterer that ever lived. And God takes out his wrath against his own son to satisfy the justice of God. In the words that Matt sang a little earlier, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. This was the climax of his suffering. The soldiers had mocked and scourged him, put a crown of thorns on his skull. They'd spit on him. They'd plucked out his beard. They'd pierced his hands and his, and his feet with nails. He experienced physical suffering beyond description, and yet he suffered in silence. It wasn't the physical torment. It was the spiritual anguish of being forsaken by God. In the fifth saying, you catch some of that, his agony of thirst. In the midst of the God-forsakenness of this hour, think of God-forsakenness as being excluded from God, being cut off from God. That's what was happening during those hours. Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a bystander took a sponge of wine vinegar and he lifted it up to Jesus' lips. This is the only statement from the cross that expresses anything of Jesus' physical pain. Think of that. But I would suggest to you that 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 language goes beyond simply physical thirst. Because the language, the images of darkness, thirst, death, point to hell. You see, it was during that period that Jesus was suffering hell for you and for me. You remember when, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it says, the rich man cried out, Father Abraham, let, let Lazarus dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue. That's what Jesus suffered on the cross for us as our sin bearer. The first three sayings from the cross, we see Jesus as our example. In the fourth and fifth, we see him as our sin bearer. And now in these last two, we see him as our conqueror. They express the victory that he's won. They might be the most climactic words in all of Scripture. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. This is not the despairing groan of one who's dying in defeat and resignation. It's a shout. In fact, Mark and 
Matthew both say in a loud voice, proclaiming a resounding victory. They're, they're, they're pointing to this, to Jesus, not as a victim, but as a victor. Jesus himself said, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Jesus was saying, mission accomplished. He had accomplished the work that he came to do. The work of sin bearing was now finished. There was nothing more that could be contributed. Those of you who do marathons, a few of you in the congregation know that everybody starts, everybody stops, but not everybody finishes. It's the same way in life. Everybody starts, everybody stops, but not everyone finishes the work that they were to do in this world. When Jesus said, It is finished. He was saying, I have finished the work that God sent me to do. And the great demonstration of that is that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Think of that veil, that curtain that had hung for centuries, separating the outer and inner sanctuaries, and emblematic of our inaccessibility to God. But now the penalty paid, the veil was rent, signifying that sinful men could now enter into the very presence of God because of what Jesus Christ had done. That brings us to the seventh, the final saying, his final surrender. Having just said it is finished, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Think of those words, breathed his last. It's almost as if the evangelists are deliberately avoiding the word death. Mark says he breathed his last. Uh, Matthew says he gave up his spirit. Luke says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. John said he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Why, Why such language? Because it's, it's pointing to Jesus as a victor. He was no victim. No one, Jesus said, takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. He could have escaped death right up until the last minute. He could have called, as the old hymn said, 10,000 angels. He could have come off the cross as his mockers were challenging him, but he didn't. He stayed on that cross of his own free will and deliberate choice, and he gave himself up to death. Jesus didn't have his life taken from him. He laid it down for you and for me. Jesus died for you because he loved you. I'm going to pray, and Matt's going to come and sing as we reflect on images of those three hours on the cross. Then I'll come back and lead us in our time of communion. Would you bow with me? Father, as we reflect upon these words from the cross. We're struck by the sheer greatness of Jesus' person, his unselfishness, his other-centeredness, his self-giving. We're utterly overwhelmed that you could love us so much that you sent your Son into this world to bear the penalty of sin that we clearly deserve. Help us, Lord, this evening to grasp the magnitude of that victory, and may we walk in it the rest of our days. For we ask this in Christ's name. Don't. 
set for us 